and I'm and uh, even though I'm I'm on vacation, I didn't hesitate for a second when Janice asked me if I would make myself available. And as you can see in the background, you know I'm not suffering here in Tuscany. I'm at a Agri Turismo, a beautiful place. Uh, so I I am very happy to be part of this now. Yeah, so thank you for doing it. I'm happy to see you. Mm -hmm. And if uh, I could get right into the questions now, because I'm sure a lot of eager readers who have read the book or possibly all of them now would like to hear some of these answers. Mm -hmm. The book is based in Burma. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about your time there and kind of the impact it had on you? Yeah, of course. That's a very obvious question. Why would a German author write three novels, which are set in, in Burma, and um, I, I can't really, I have never analyzed it. I, I prefer to tell you some stories and then maybe you find the answer yourself. I used to be a journalist, as you heard, I was the uh, US correspondent for Stern, then the Asia correspondent. I was transferred from New York to Hong Kong in 1995. And I was very, I could see I would be very busy. China was opening up, there was a big earthquake in Japan, there was some turmoil in Indonesia. So I was traveling constantly. And I had this kind of inner voice, and this almost sounds like a Burmese story. And some of my Burmese friends seriously believe that I must have been a Burmese in a previous life because I love that country so much and I understand the culture to a certain extent. So there was this inner voice telling me, go to Burma or Myanmar, how it's called now. And I can tell you why. And if, if you had shown me a world map at, at that time and um, told me, please point out Burma. I might have even confused it with Thailand or Laos or Bangladesh. Um, I, 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 I don't know why I wanted to go. And at that time, nobody went to Burma. No journalists, no tourists, no politicians, uh, nobody who worked in um, development or whatever. And Burma was kind of off the world map because it was run as it is again by the military. It had been closed for decades. It was almost impossible for 40 years to get a visa. Uh, there was no internet, of course, in those days. And then it opened up very slowly, early 90s. And by the time I went, I could get a visa for four weeks. And I remember I came from Bangkok, which is the capital of Thailand, and it's just one hour flight. I don't know, it's like New York, Boston or, or something. It's not really far. Um, and I remember it was late in the afternoon and we approached Yangon, which was the capital at that time, which is a big city. It's like 7 million people live there. And we approached, uh, the plane was almost empty. I remember it really precisely. It was a Boeing 737, Thai Air. And, and we flew over Yangon, this big city, and there were no lights. It, it was unbelievable. I mean, in any small town in America, there would be more lights at seven o'clock than it was in Yangon. And I thought, wow, what's, what, that is strange. And we touched down, it was a small airport. There was no other airplane. And the 20 people or so got off and we got through immigration. It took forever. And then there were a few people waiting outside with rundown cars. And I got a car and told him to drive me to my hotel. And we slowly, he drove very slowly, we drove into the city. And, you know, I just had been to Hong Kong and then Thailand, big cities, lively cities. And here, it was completely different. There were no lights, there were no shops, there were basically only little markets and little tea houses. The streets were completely empty. There were no neon sign, no advertising. People were walking on the streets. Kids were playing soccer on the streets. There were lots of monks. Men were walking together, holding hands. They were all wearing long jeans, no jeans, no trousers. And I figured this is amazing. I mean, I had traveled one hour, but I realized I had traveled back in time for 60, for 80 years. And this is a privilege I appreciate today even more because nowadays you can have that. Now you have the internet, you have connection. Those days are over. My kids can't fly for an hour and travel years, 80 years back in time, unless maybe they fly in the Amazon or something, but not to a big city like, like, like Yangon, not to a big country like Burma. So, wow, what a privilege it was. I drove slowly into town 
And I was so puzzled, so confused that I asked my driver if there was a McDonald's in town. I wanted to see how far the West had approached. And he kept driving and then he turned around and asked me, McDonald's, you said, is the guy maybe Scottish? So I realized he had never heard about a fast food chain called McDonald's. And even now, today, there is no McDonald's in Yangon. <laughs> Just one Burger King at the new airport. So I realized, well, this is really different. And I dropped off my stuff at the hotel and I kept walking through, through, through the city. And there were lots of people and there were small markets and the tea houses were full and it was hot and humid. And then I heard a strange sound and it all got dark, pitch dark, because there was a blackout. It still happens, but nowadays, you know, you have blackout and then seconds later you hear this and the generators start. In those days, people didn't have generators. So it stayed dark for a little while, but people were used to it. So they started to lit candles and they put these candles on the tables in tea houses, in door frames, window frames, on the sidewalk. And after a little while, the whole neighborhood and at the feeling the whole city was lit just by candles. It was a magical experience and it was very really run down the whole city, the poverty, but still all candles and people. The only thing I heard were the human voice, people laughing, people, kids crying, whispering, talking. So it was, it was an amazing uh, scene. And then I heard another amazing sound and that was singing. And I followed these songs and I ended up in a courtyard or tea house in a park and it was always the same scene. There was a young man sitting in front of a young woman. Sometimes the man was playing the guitar and the man was singing songs and only later did I learn that it was a Burmese tradition that you know a couple calls in love they get together there's not much to do so they get out and the man sings love songs to the girl. And I found that incredibly romantic, as probably you do. Um, I was just very happy it's not a German tradition because I would still be single. I can absolutely not sing. Even my three kids can bear my lullabies. Uh, so um, I, I appreciated it, but I'm happy and we don't do that in Germany. So I stayed for three weeks and traveled around Burma and had incredible, I mean, I, mean, I met people um, I ended up in Kalor by, by chance uh, again, and I met a wonderful man I'm still friends with. And uh, after two days, he asked me if he should take me on a trek. He wanted to show me other sides of Burma and bring me to a village. We would stay overnight and I had time. So I said, yeah, let's, let's hike. So we hiked to a Pao village right around Kalor. Kalor. If you have read my books, you know, there are a lot of different minorities ethnic minorities, the Paos, the Palong, the Shan, the Karen, Kachin, Burmese, of course. So we ended up in this village and my friend, he is Burmese, he is from Kalor, he speaks the Pao language and we were allowed to stay because he was well respected and well known, my friend. We stayed with the village head and it was an incredible evening. We, you know, all elderly came and they asked me questions. We slept on the floor the next morning. We had a nice little breakfast and then we were supposed to leave. And I learned another Burmese tradition that if you visit with a friend, another friend, it's not like, you know, when you leave, they say, bye-bye, you know, take care, safe travels. You get a farewell gift. And the whole village came because I was such an oddity. I mean, I was really... Uh, very exotic and and they wanted to give me a, a farewell gift but these people are very poor they don't have anything they grow tea and basically that's what they have so I got a bag of tea but not this size not this size it was like a 50 pound bag of tea I mean incredibly large and I left to drink tea and I stood there in front of like 150 people and the village head very proudly gave me the gift and I, I was deeply touched, but I said, you know, this is very kind. Um, <laughs> uh, but do, do, do you have a smaller uh, bag? And I said, no, but it's not just for you. Uh, it's for the whole family. And at that time, my wife lived in New York. I lived in Hong Kong. And I said, that's kind. But um, my wife lives, um, I, I, I live by myself. Um, 
and it was translated from English into the Pao. And when everybody had understood, the 150 people, I think nobody, not never ever in my whole life, have so many people looked at me with such a pity. He lives by himself. My God. And then they turned kind of tense. And only later did my friend tell me why. Because in Burma, you do not live by yourself. Whether you are single or a widow or whoever, you live surrounded by your family. The only people who do not live by themselves are the people who are so mean, so nasty, that nobody wants to live with them. So they figure this guy seems to be a nice guy. Why doesn't anybody want to live with him? And I, I sensed that something was wrong and I felt sorry because it was such a nice gesture. So I told them I live in Hong Kong and my wife lives in New York, but I call her every night. And it was translated again into the Po. And then everybody smiled. That was okay. If I call her every night, then no problem. But the village head got suspicious. Said, really every night? Said, yes. Wow. Then you must have a very loud voice. And only then did I realize he thought that Hong Kong is on top of one mountain, New York's on top of another mountain. And every night I go to the edge of my village and I, I call around, uh, Anna, how are you? And, and I would hear it in, in New York. Um, so I didn't explain to them uh, how it worked. I said, yeah, I, I call her every night and I have, I have a loud voice. So I spent three weeks, I had incredible meetings. I entered a completely different world. And I had to go back to Hong Kong and I had just one wish. I wanted to go back to Burma as soon as possible, but I didn't come back with a story. So Stern didn't want to send me again. But then in 1996, Aung San Suu Kyi, at that time, the opposition leader, she was under house arrest and she was freed. So that was a story for Stern. I went again. And of course I went to Kalor and my friend said, you know, you, you want to go again to this village. They are still talking about you. And I said, yeah, I have time, let's go. And I brought little gifts for the kids and so on. So um, we went back and it was a big welcome. It was very nice and everybody came together and then we assembled at the village head's house. He had a big house and there was a closet and we all had to sit in front of the closet. I, of course, I was the guest of honor. I sat in front, first row with my friend. And, you know, we sat there looking at this closet and I realized something special was going on. Maybe they had another gift for the, for the guest. Maybe they had hand carved a Buddha or whatever. So at a certain time, the house was completely full. The village had got up, he opened the closet and inside was really something special, a TV set. The military had given away TV sets. In the meantime, black and white run on batteries because they wanted to spread the propaganda better. But these people are not stupid, of course. They didn't watch the propaganda. But once a week, there was only one channel, the state-owned official Burmese uh, channel. Uh, once a week, they showed a foreign movie. And it was my lucky night. They were so proud that they could show me this they probably thought I'd never seen a foreign movie. It was one hour, all in English. It was a crime story set in Los Angeles and not much happened except that helicopters exploded, people shot each other, stabbed each other, killed each other, cars crashed. And people started to look at me very suspiciously because I looked very similar to these people who kept killing each other, right? So after an hour, it was over. The village head was a little disturbed because it was all in English. They did no subtitles. They didn't understand a word. So he closed, he turned off the TV. He closed the cabinet again. Then he turned around and said, hmm, Jen Philip, it seems to be very dangerous where you are from. If you like, you can stay with us. It seems to be safer. I was very touched by the gesture, by their thinking. Of course, I didn't stay. But I've been back many, many, many times every year, probably 30 times altogether. I have become very close to people there. Um, my books, all three books are translated into Burmese. And if I'm known a kind of local celebrity anywhere, then it's in Burma. People approach me in tea house. I sign books. We do readings there. So that's wonderful. And all these encounters, these friendships, I think have had a deep impact on, on me, on my writing. That's why it shows 
to place the other fairing heartbeats that I think I couldn't put it anywhere else. It's such a Burmese story to a certain extent and a very universal story at the same time. So I don't know, I fell in love with the people. Every trip is a challenge. I have to admit it's not especially, you know, lately I haven't been back, but um, things are changing before the military took over for the better and for the worse. So this is not, um, I don't want to idolize it. It's life is tough there. Um, the people are poor. They are incredibly hospitable. I have never met a Burmese who pitied him or herself. They're very brave people. And yeah, it, somehow this kind of uh, relationship, this love developed between me and, and this country. And um, yeah, I can't tell you why. I just can give you stories. If you want to hear more stories, uh, you read uh, my books. They are full of stories because I couldn't write them without being there so often and doing so much research. Thank you. Those kind of like little windows you're giving us with those stories is just amazing because it's stuff extra on top of the book just mm -hmm. wonderful little experiences and interactions you had with the people there um i think you answered my next question but i'm going to ask it anyway uh a big part of the book takes place in new york did you spend time there yes i lived um in new york for eight years between 90 and 95 and then 99 2000 and 2001 uh, but two th the last three years, I spent mostly upstate New York, near Monticello, Forestburg, Catskills. That's why I wrote The Out of Rain Heartbeats. I took three sabbatical years to write this novel. But we had a place in the city as well, so we kind of um, spent time in the city and upstate. And I, I, I call my second, New York is my second hometown. I, I'm really, I love the city again, you know, with all its flaws and uh, wonderful things. Um, I felt kind of very, very, very comfortable there. Thank you. There are so many wonderful characters in the art of hearing heartbeats. Are they based at all on real people? Yes, Uba, Uba, the beloved Uba, of course, is based on, on a friend, a very close friend I met also in 95 in Calor. And he has been joining basically on every trip. He has visited me in Germany. Winston is his name. I thank him in every book and the acknowledgement. He is a wonderful character, 74, 75. He always says he is 30% Uber. And, and that's true. Another 30% is, is a bookseller I met in Yangon on my first trip who restorated books like Uber does. I learned a lot from him about the value of books um, about the value of many things I took for granted. I mean, traveling to Burma makes me very humble. I know what a privileged life I live, how many things I take for granted. He didn't take anything for granted, exactly like Uber. Some of the quotes from Uber are actually from him, from the bookseller, so to a certain extent. And then it's 30% uh, imagination. So, and I think all other characters... I mean, I spend so much time there, of course. I watch, I, I listen, I meet people, I go out, I explore. So this all has an incredible impact on, on the, all three books, I think. And one of the greatest compliments I ever got about my books, the three Burma books, I was on, the, on a reading tour in Burma. And we had a reading in Kalor. And people came there from places 10 hours by bus just to join in, to listen to me. And... Uh, one guy, he spoke a little English, he wanted his book signed, and, and I, I did, and he said he loves my books for three reasons. One, they make him cry. Second, they comfort him. And the third reason was he learns so much about his country in my books. And I thought, wow, when I hear that from a Burmese, um, that's, a, that's a compliment, absolutely. Thank you. The two main characters have disabilities. Can you tell us how you were able to write them so convincingly? Mm. Ha. That's a good question. Um, no, um, I did some research, of course. I never interviewed a blind person because I thought maybe that would get too, that would get too 
to direct to there would be not enough space for my imagination but i read five or six books written by people who turned blind how they experienced the world i patched my eyes for days my kids had a ball when it was you know walking around the house hitting my head at the door frames and so on um that's how i did no i just imagined it i i can tell you how i came up with this story about the blind boy that that's a lovely story i um i was playing catch with my son on the lawn in, in upstate new york and our son was like two and a half at that time and we rested and he put his head on my chest and then he said daddy i hear a sound uh, in your chest i said what what do you mean what kind of sound um i'm always afraid of getting sick so i, <clears throat> I thought what, what do you mean uh, a sound he said oh, it makes boom 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 oh yeah that's my heart you're hearing and he loved that that he could hear daddy's heartbeat and the next morning he came into our bed and he snuggled again put his head on, on on my chest and he said oh your heart sounds different today and then i really got anxious he said what, what do you mean sounds different uh, and um, he said oh it makes boom 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 ah no uh, sorry the other way around it makes boom boom the day before it makes boom 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 i said yeah now it sounds different because I just woke up. Our hearts sound different when we are exhausted or woke up or we exercised. And for a little while, a few days, it was kind of his favorite game, listening to daddy's heartbeat. He came during the day and said, let me listen to your heartbeat. And then he described how it sounded. And then I thought, wow, how would it be if, if you can hear heartbeats from afar? You know, and then the whole story kind of evolved. You're, you know, a guy turns blind he has to, and so on. Well, you answered my next question, so I'm not going to ask that because it was really about just how you came up with that idea of the gift that Tin Min had. So yeah. there you go. Perfect. Uh, a big part of the story is how superstitious the people of Burma are. Tin Win's mother abandons him because she believes he is cursed based on the time of day of his birth and what she is told by an astrologist. Can you elaborate on your experience with superstition? Yes, that's that's a story many of you probably won't believe, but I swear, I promise, it did happen exactly the way I'm telling you now. Before I went to Burma, I wasn't very superstitious at all, actually. But I soon realized that Burmese people are extremely superstitious and that astrology plays a very important part in their life. And when I decided to write this book, I knew I have to do some research because I want to experience how it works so that I can describe it. And I asked my friend in Kalo, is there an astrologist here? And he said, oh yeah, a very well-known one, I'll take you there. And it's basically exactly how I describe it in the book. I met an old man in his hut. Uh, he had short hair, white short hair, you know, was already in his seventies, looked even older. And I didn't even prepare for questions. I just wanted to experience it. I said, you know, I'm, I, my question is, I'm, I'm a journalist and I want to write a novel and I would like to meet, I would like to know if this is a success. This will be a success. He said, yeah, please give me your birthday, your date, location, everything. I gave him Hamburg. I knew the time because I knew he would ask the question I had inquired with my mom. And then he had a chart book and he did some calculations. And then he smiled and said, oh, don't worry. Your book will be a big success. <laughs> I was very happy. Love to hear that. But I was superstitious. Uh, not at all. I was very suspicious. I said, um, okay, I have another question for you. Um, and I had the time, the location, the time, the day of a little son within the extended family. He was like two and a half at that time who had a serious eye problem. And for whatever reason, I gave him his um, time and, and, and all the things he needed, the information. And he did his calculation and then he didn't smile and he said, oh, this child will cause some problems for his parents, some worries. Okay, that's not so unusual in the West that children cause worries for their parents said can you be a little more precise and he had his chart log he did some calculations he said yeah health problems okay not too many two and a half year olds have health problems but it happens that yeah um, can you be 
even more precise. And he had to do some more calculations. He consulted some books. It really took like 10 minutes. Then he said, yeah, health problems in his head. And now it got spooky and I got goosebumps. And I did ask, can you be even more precise? And many of you will know the answer. After a few minutes, he said, yes, in his eyes. And that turned my world upside down, I tell you, because there was no way this man could have known about the eye problems of this little child. I still don't know what to make out of this story. It's, I think, like Uba says in one of the books, not everything that is true can be explained and not everything that can be explained is true. Um, I have to ac accept the fact that I can't make sense out of it, but it happened. I once told this to a physicist in, in Israel. It was interesting because he is, was a very known uh, scientist. And I said, you, you're a physicist. Tell me, make sense out of this. How could this happen? And he said, oh, that's easy. This guy could read your mind. There's so many things we cannot measure, but there are you know, waves we cannot measure yet. Maybe one day we will. But when you think, of course, there are waves. You, you, something is there. And maybe he picked it up. I don't know. That, that's almost like a scientific uh, uh, explanation. Um, I don't have any other. Um, but I, since then, I, again, I've become very humble when it comes to superstition. I, I don't laugh at it at, uh, anymore. Agreed. Agreed. Were there specific authors that you drew inspiration from when writing the art of hearing heartbeats? Um, actually, Contemporaries. No. I think one book I read um, uh, before, when I write fiction, I don't read fiction um, because either it's bad fiction and it's a waste of time or it's good fiction and it makes me depressed. And I think, oh my God, I can't write like that. I stopped writing it. Um, so, but I read, um, how, how is it trend? The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. That's a writer from India, which is still one of my favorite books. Maybe that was an influence, yeah. Otherwise, no. Okay. The Art of Hearing Heartbeats is an international bestseller. How long did it take you to write this book? About two years. Mm -hmm. Now, this was your on first hand, On the other hand, I would say it took me two years to write, but I was 39 when I, when I wrote it. I think I kind of unconsciously I researched for that book all my life all I knew about love and life I put into that book so kind of unconsciously I had done my research uh, but actually writing was like two years much longer than two years if you do all that personal research yeah this was your first novel can you tell us about your experience getting it published Oh, that was not difficult. I had published a nonfiction book in Germany about China because I, you know, traveled in China extensively. I have written three novels which are set in China as well. But that one, I, I wrote the first hundred pages and sent it to my publisher who had published a nonfiction book and he liked it and said, you know, we, we, we will do it. The problem was getting it published in America. It took me 10 years to get it published in America. Um, so, because it wasn't a big success in Germany at all, and I, um, nobody was interested. I couldn't even find a translator. I went to New York. I wanted to talk to agents. Nobody even received me. I sent it to editors at all the big publishing houses. Nobody ever got back to me. Um, so I had to find the translator or the known translator didn't want to take it on because they said, you know, your book is not a success, not even in Germany, nobody would publish it in America. Um, but I was convinced it would do well in America. Um, so I found a translator. He translated the whole book. Again, I sent it out to agents, to publishing houses. Nobody even got back to me. I think they didn't read it. Um, and then my last hope for private connection he said, you know, he knows a publisher in New York. She has a small house, other press, Judith Gorovich is her name, send it to her. And I remember I told my wife, this is my last hope. If I send it to this Judith and if she doesn't reply or if she says no, I give up. I had spent a lot of money. I paid the translation myself. I had been to New York again a couple of times trying to talk to um, agents and um, to no avail. 
So Judith was my last last hope. And I sent it to Judith by email. And um, two weeks later, I got an email, Judith Gorbich, regarding the other train heartbeats. And I remember it was a Sunday morning. And I read the email. I read it again. And then I woke up my wife. Because Judith said uh, she loves the book and she will do it. And she had very low expectations. She said, you know, we are a small house. Usually our books do like three or 5,000 copies. But your book has broad appeal. Maybe we, maybe we can do 10. Maybe we sell 10,000 copies. And I don't know the latest numbers, Janice. You would know them better than I do. But I think by now, other press has sold half a million copies in America alone. I think it's over half a million if you count in ebooks and stuff. It's yeah. more than, uh, yeah, it's more than 650,000. It's, it's pretty incredible. Incredible. I mean, and then other countries, uh, you know, were interested. And this is all thanks to this wonderful publishing house because Judith and her team, they did a fantastic job and that first book came out. The, I love the cover and they wrapped it in gift paper uh, and uh, sent it out to booksellers. So they put advertising in the New York Times, a whole page for an unknown author for his debut novel. So I owe other press a lot. Uh, really, they did a fantastic job. And I all of you, owe all of you a lot because in the end, I think it's a word of mouth. I was never on NPR, not on Good Morning America, no review in the New York Times. It's a word of mouth. People love these books and they talk about it and spread the word. So, and, um, and other press owes you a lot because you're our number one best-selling author. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. People love the book, but why do you think people feel such a connection to Tin, Win, and Mimi? Ah, good question. You know, some people call me a dreamer, and I dispute that, actually, because I believe in people and um, in the good of people, actually. And I think the other thing, Heartbeat, tells in the end, it's a story full of sorrow, full of pain, but in the end, it tells a very positive story about the power of love. And I think people recognize that, that we read so much about hatred and anger and, and you know, in America, how divided, but in other countries as well. But I think the most powerful force in us and in our lives is a positive force. It's called love. And I think that's, in the end, that's what the book is about about true love, people who are so connected over time and they can't be separated, not by time, not by distance, whatever. And, and I think people feel connected with it. They sense there's, there's some truth in it. And that's why it's so successful, not just in America, but in Israel, in Norway, and I mean, you name it. It's, it's a huge bestseller in so many countries. Um, not because people are all of a sudden interested in Burma or in blind people or in handicapped people. I think because they sense that even though there's a lot of pain and anger and sorrow in this book, in the end, it's a book about the most powerful positive force in our lives. Yes. And The Art of Hearing Heartbeats became a trilogy. Please tell us about the other two books. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, it wasn't planned as a trilogy. And I think when you read all three books, you sense that it's not like, you know, there's some beginning and in the third book, you, um, uh, you get the, the uh, solution of a problem which um, came up in the first book. I finished The Other Thing Heartbeats and that was it. And then a few years later, I was back in Calor visiting friends and I'm, I'm a daydreamer. I love to sit in coffee shops and tea shops and just watch around and daydream. I always have a pen and a notebook with me. And then I was sitting in my favorite tea shop in Calor, and in my imagination, Julia came along. She walked down the road. I said, Julia, hi, how are you? Come sit down with me. How have you been? You know, what did the story do to you? And we started chatting in my, you know, mind. And this chat, this conversation became so interesting that I thought maybe there's more to it. Maybe it's a short story or something. I went home and I started writing. And it, out of this meeting in Calor, by chance, became the second book, um, A Well-Tempered Heart. And when I finished A Well-Tempered Heart, I really wanted to know how the story ends. Julia, you know, I don't want to give away for too much for the, for the people who haven't read um, the second one. But Julia returns to Burma after 10 years 
and she has a deep personal crisis in New York. She starts to hear voices and she's not married, no children, professionally very successful, but she is longing. She's searching for meaning in her life. And she decides to go back to Burma to, to, to go back to Uba and have a talk. And so she travels back to Burma kind of to find herself and she falls in love, but I don't want to give away too much. But in the end, you know, the story is how will this love evolve? She falls in love with a very poor monk, Tata, and um, who has been through terrible things, but they have a very deep connection. And in the third book, I really tell the story about this love. And it's a very complex book, The Heart Remembers, which just came out. It's probably the most complex, but also the most personal book of these three. Different love stories between Julia and Tata, but also about Uba and Tata and Julia's child. Again, I don't want to give away too much, but um, it's also set in New York partly because, again, Julia comes from New York, very different culture. Tata from Burma, different culture. And the question to this book is, is their love strong enough to bridge, to get this, to overbridge this, this huge gap, the cultural differences, the different worlds they come from? Is their love strong enough? And um, if, when you read these books, you will find out yourself. <laughs> Thank you. And with the release of the third, could we ask, are there any other projects you're working on right now? Yeah, I just finished a book. Um, it's called The Rebel and the Thief. And if I'm not mistaken, other press uh, will publish this as well. Janice, is that correct? Yeah, so that's what I've been told. So looking forward <laughs> to it. Yeah, um, this is um, a novel, which it's something completely different. It's set in a fictional, uh, fictional country. And um, it came to me, I don't know how, I was sitting in the garden, deeply depressed. And all of a sudden I had the first sentence and I said to myself before I spend the rest of the uh, afternoon here, I go inside, write the first sentence, maybe a second one will come. And there was a second and the third one. And within five months, I wrote a whole novel. I, it kind of exploded. Usually I write one page, two pages a day. This time I wrote five to six pages a day. It was great fun, uh, but a completely different story. And it will come out in Germany next month. I'm, I'm very excited about it um, and the writing process with the other books was slower. Um, this one was almost like a huge joy. <laughs> very good, very good. Now I'm going to think, Trish, we have some time maybe to take a question or two from our participants. Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay. I want to take a question. And they can turn on their cameras also. I think we're okay with bandwidth. Great. Light. Okay. So if they want to uh, turn on their videos, they can, absolutely can. This question, let's see, is from Maria, Maria Daly. In the dedication you mentioned Vivian Wong, 1969 and 2000, what was her role in the book? Actually, she didn't have she didn't have a role in the book. She was a very good friend of my wife and me, and she died, as you can see, very young, completely unexpectedly. She had an aneurysm in her head, and um, that touched me deeply while I wrote the book. And I thought, you know, I make this into a memory of her. Thank you. And now, this personal question I just have. For your future projects, do you foresee you may be focusing on other countries, possibly kind of a tale of another city or another country that we don't get to hear about often? You know, uh, Burma is not on everyone's mindset or map. It's not something that you hear about in the news, unfortunately, until recently with the coup and political situations. Do you foresee you may be telling a story we don't hear often from another country around the world? I have, I have, I had and have a story idea about a, a novel set in Japan because I've been to Japan many times and fascinated by it. And I think I really have a good story. But in order to write it, I have to go back to Japan. Um, and that's not possible right now, probably not for the next few months or even a year because of the corona restrictions. So I have that in mind, Japan, but another story came up and finally that would be set in New York, uh, Las Vegas and San Francisco. 
And I hope I can travel there in the fall. And that would probably be my, my next project, a novel set in, in the United States and partly in, in Germany, but mostly in the United States. Very good, very good. More corners of the world to hear from. <laughs> I'd like to just tell our participants, if anyone has a question, address it to me in the chat box and I will ask the author while we still have a few minutes here. I don't wanna take up any more time from his precious vacation, which we wish yes. was there. <laughs> I'm hearing the crickets in the background in Tuscany and it's much <laughs> different from my current environment and a lot of our environments <laughs> that we're projecting from. <laughs> yes, and we are so grateful that you joined us from your vacation. Oh, I'm really very happy that we're doing this and I hope I get you interested about the second and the third book because as an author all your books you love all your books and they are almost like children or something and of course the other thing Heartbeats is the most loved of the kids by many people because it's so special and for many reasons but sometimes I think book two and three they are a little bit in the shadow of the big brother and, and, but they are so dear to me, and I think they are different. They are probably a little more complex. We learn even more about Burma, Julia. So if I kept you curious about book two or three or both, um, that would be, that would be, uh, I would be delighted. I have some questions coming in. I also have a participant who has their hand raised, but unfortunately it doesn't have your name, just your phone number on there. So if you want to type in the chat box, uh, but I do have um, a I'm sorry. There, there is no chat box through the phone. Oh, okay. um, I, I was just interested in um, the author's interest in traveling and when this started and how he chooses countries to travel in. Oh, that's a good question. I wasn't born a traveler. My father, my parents, they don't speak English. I think they never left the German speaking area in Europe. Um, the first time I was abroad, I was like 13 or 14. I didn't speak much English until I was 20. So I wasn't born a traveler. Somehow I got it. And now traveling has been such, has been part of my life for the last uh, 35 years. So this Corona restrictions, hit me very hard. I have to tell you, you know, I, I can't complain. I feel sorry to complain or, or I feel terrible to complain like he, because I'm healthy. I live a comfortable life, but this, these travel restrictions somehow, um, they are, they are hard on me. I have by now many friends in Asia and America. I can't see them, visit them. I don't know. I, I think traveling makes me a better person because I, I'm a, I'm an observer. I love to watch. I love to observe. I don't like to be part of big gatherings or groups. I'm an outsider. I feel comfortable being an outsider in other countries. I love to learn. I love to challenge myself in Unmute different situations. And start video. Okay, good. But there you are. See your big head there. <laughs> and traveling. That's me. Oh, who else? It's, it's, it's a constant challenge. Yeah, there you, go. you can mute them, Anthony. I did apologize. They're muted. Oh, no, okay. Okay. So I hope I answered your question. I have a question here from another participant. This book touched upon the beauty of other civilizations right. approach so and celebration of death. The coming together of the community all for right, Amy good. And Henry. George is all set up. You'll be here for a good while. If so you can mute yourself. It's Alexis who's on camera. I'm sorry. I didn't get the question. Sorry, let me start again. So the book touched upon the beauty of other civilizations approach and even the celebration of death. The coming together of the community for Mimi and Tinwin's death was incredibly moving. Have you experienced these celebrations and approach to death yourself while traveling and the difference of it to Western society? Yes, as an observer, I noticed that people 
deal with death very differently in Burma. Of course, they are absolutely heartbroken or sad when the loved one dies, like we are here. But if you seriously believe in, in karma and in many lives, one after another, then this is just one. And there is another, and there was a previous one. And then it might be a little easier to deal with death. Um, I learned that in Burma. Sometimes I was really surprised to find um, that they had a different way of approaching it. That, for instance, when someone young died in the neighborhood, I always ask, oh, what did he die of? Burmese never do that because they don't know. People drop there, people die in hospital. They, they don't know how they, why they died or what off they died or whatever. So they are equally heartbroken, but maybe a little casual, more casual because they think, you know, they will be reborn and reborn and reborn. And that might make you a little more relaxed. <laughs> um, I don't believe it. So I'm less relaxed when it comes to dying. Um, another question. Your English seems so fluent. Would you consider writing in English? No, I have too much respect for the language. My mother tongue, my native language is German. Sometimes I, for the third book, I think I added a chapter. I sometimes, I, I write in English uh, letters and add little essays and things, but I would never write a novel in English. No, I doubt it. And also, what is the quotation that meant the most to you? Quotation? What, what the quotation, whether in the book, the question was, what is the quotation that means the most to you? Mm, never thought of it. Um, maybe, maybe, you know, one important thing is what I quoted, what Uba said, you know, not everything that is true can be explained and not everything that can be expla explained is true. Um, you know, just accept the contradictions, things we can't explain. Uh, that's, that's an important part of, of, of the thinking of the books, yeah. And also just passing along praise that our participants wanted to send to you, saying you are a great author. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much Certainly appreciated. Are. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I think on that note, there's no other questions coming in. I want to thank you as well and thank our participants. Uh, this was wonderful. Trish, do you have anything you want to? I want to thank Janice Goldklang again. And my, um, we, we're just thrilled. My pleasure. Event. It was so great to see you, Jan Philippe. We yes. miss you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Anthony. Thank you. I you hope did a great uh, job. people see each other. Thank you. Very, I hope so soon. Again, very soon. Sending you yeah. a lot of love. Take care. Thanks to all, and thank you very much thank for you. Bye -bye. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, enjoy Bye. your vacation. Thanks, Trish. Thank bye bye, all. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>